Okay, so good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Angela Scott, and I am the library assistant here at the Billie Jean King Main Library's Miller Special Collections Room. On behalf of our senior librarian of collection services, Jade Wheeler, our special collections librarian, Jeff Whalen, um, and all the staff here at the Long Beach Public Library, I'd like to welcome you to the Miller Room's local history lecture series. Today, we're pleased to present a dynamic program with our special guest, Maureen Neely, who is a local historian and librarian with the Long Beach Public Library. This is one of a series of lecture programs that will be presented periodically in the Miller Room throughout the year. In addition to our Art of Nature lecture series, our musical performance programs, Miller Room Book Club and Short Story Reading Group, and much more. Please keep an eye on our LBPL calendar and website for upcoming events, and we hope you'll join us again for more of these special programs as they become available. Now, while we have you all here, we'd also like to mention our next big program happening here in the Miller Room, part of our poetry and fiction writing series. On Saturday, November 14th from 2 to 4 p.m., please join us for an engaging workshop with local author Stephen Diebel, who will lead a live Zoom event on writing the short story that will be sure to get your creative juices flowing. Now this program will provide an overview of what constitutes a short story today, including flash fiction. Workshop attendees will be able to draft very short pieces um, to share with our presenter, and then he'll work with participants to revise their work and receive helpful tips for marketing stories to publishers and agents. There are only a limited number of people who can participate in this free workshop and registration is required to attend. So for more information about this event, please visit our website at lbpl.org or call the main library for more information. We'll also have a variety of other programs rolling out in the next few months, so please keep an eye on the LBPL website and calendar for more details. Now, getting back to our program for today, it's our pleasure to once again welcome and introduce our featured speaker this afternoon, Maureen Neely. Born and raised in San Francisco, Maureen is a fourth generation Californian. After receiving her BA in history from Gonzaga University, she went on to earn her master's in library and information studies from UC Berkeley. She's currently working as a librarian here with the Long Beach Public Library but she's also worked as a research librarian in other library systems, as a medical library supervisor, and as a fundraising consultant. She served on the board of trustees for many organizations throughout California, including the McHenry Museum, the Stanislaus Connections Editorial Board, and the Monterey Historical Society. She also offers workshops, tours, and programs about local history and on how to research the history of a home. As owner of a research consulting business called House Stories, Maureen has researched over 400 properties, residential, commercial, and multifamily throughout Long Beach since 2004. She also writes freelance for various publications about neighborhood histories, local lore, and architecture. Maureen is a longtime active member of Long Beach Heritage and president of the Belmont Heights Community Association, She's past recipient of the Preservationist of the Year Award, and she serves on the advisory board for the Historical Society and for Walk Long Beach. She is on the executive board for the Long Beach Navy Heritage Memorial Trust as well. Now at the end of today's program, please stay for Q&A that we'll be moderating through our chat. And if you have any questions, please also type them into the chat bar. And you'll see a chat button at the bottom of your screen and you can type and submit your questions there. And Maureen and I will moderate these questions at the end. The program will officially end at 4 p.m. if you need to leave, but you're welcome to stay and continue asking questions via chat until about 4.15. We'll also be sending out an email next week with a link to the archived video recording of this program so you can watch it later at your leisure. So thank you again for joining us today and without further ado, ladies and gentlemen, the Miller Room and Long Beach Public Library is very pleased to present our very special guest, Maureen Neely. Hey, thank you, Angela. That was a, a great intro. Wow. I'm not that old. It makes me so old. 
Um, anyway, thanks a million uh, to um, Long Beach staff, Long Beach Public Library staff, and of course, Director Glenda Williams um, and uh, Angela Scott, who you just heard from as the library assistant for the Miller Room. Uh, it's been a wonderful uh, working with them to get this set up. I'd also like to thank the Arts Council of Long Beach. Uh, they uh, provided a grant for me to uh, pursue this research. So um, it's, it's been an awesome opportunity for me to really uh, get a handle on some of the things you're gonna be seeing today and for me to uncover some unusual um, uh, art and, uh, and stories. Um, I'd also like to uh, uh, thank the support of Long Beach Heritage and the Historical Society of Long Beach. This has been a, a project that uh, we've all been in, involved with for a number of years. And in particular, if you're out there, Dr. Kay Briegel and Karen Clements and Ruth Ann Lair, uh, they reactivated the interest in WPA art and, and architecture and New Deal um, programs uh, back in the 1980s when we were in danger of losing a lot of these buildings and pieces of art. So um, again, uh, that, that interest in preservation of these pieces continues today but it, we wouldn't have the, these pieces uh, without their, um, their advocacy back in the 1980s. So I'm just gonna dive right in. We're gonna talk a little bit about, um, the uh, set, set in context, what WPA art in ar architecture is in Long Beach and how an earthquake and the Great Depression, in my opinion, shaped the style and sensibility in the city. Uh, let's see, is it not? I think I could do this. Let's try that. There we go. Okay, so um, here's a, just a little uh, uh, calendar I pulled off the internet. Uh, it's called the, you know, a little graphic design about the Great Depression. And you can see you know, what was happening uh, in Long Beach. Uh, I've inserted some of those things. So um, we have an oil strike in 1921 and between 1920 and 23, we annexed uh, Zafiria area and North Long Beach. And then in 1933, we had a big earthquake. And the, the reason I put this out here is because, you know, we, we don't operate in a vacuum here in Long Beach. So things were happening in the rest of the world that affected us. But also we were growing by leaps and bounds. Um, between 1910 and 1920, our population increased um, over 200% from 17,800 people to over 55,000 people. And then again, from 1920 to 1930, we increased from 55,000 to 142,000. So we were an area that people wanted to live. We were living in an area that was growing. And that's important when we think about the amount of people that were coming here and it was putting Long Beach on the map. I also wanna talk a little bit about the fact that we struck oil in 1921 up in Signal Hill, though we had been looking for oil and, and taking oil out of the ground for years before that but it really brought people to the city uh, during that time. So the early 20s and then into the 30s. Okay, so the 1930s, the depression starts around 1929 <clears throat> for the rest of the country, but um, people were losing their livelihoods. Uh, this is a, a Hooverville in the, in the Sacramento River area. And I bring this up because um, Hoovervilles were named for Hubert Hoover, who was the president at the time. Uh, he was there, uh, our president from 1928 to 1932. Uh, and my uncle used to live in Sacramento. He, my, my parents were, were raised there, not born there, but raised there. And he used to go down and hang out with what he called the hobos in, in the Hooverville. So this is a, a picture of what he would have done in, uh, in 1930s. And today is my dad's birthday. He was born in 1912. His, uh, he, was, he was raised, his, his early adulthood was, uh, was fashioned by the Great Depression. So it's a, near, it's a story that's near and dear to my heart. So here's a, here's a timeline of what we're gonna be talking about today. We had the stock market crash, Hubert Hoover started, he tried to quell the panic with the uh, uh, Reconstruction Finance Corporation or the RFC, um, but he lost the election and Franklin Delano Roosevelt was elected and things started to heat up. Uh, people were hungry, people were out of jobs, the stock market had crashed. Um, it was a trickle down effect for, um, for the common people and for some of the very wealthy. 
So as, as Franklin Delano Roosevelt tried to put people back to work and try to figure out ways to jumpstart the economy, um, you know, always construction comes to mind and, and those types of projects. But then there were these, these, these other types of people. They were, they, were, they were artists and they weren't necessarily good on, on the line. They weren't good schlepping stones. So, you know, what were we to do with our artists? And I love the fact that um, the Harry Hopkins, who was the uh, gentleman that Franklin Roosevelt put in charge of the New Deal programs, um, he decided that, you know, artists, hell, they've got to eat just like other people. And so that's why we have um, programs that focused on putting artists to work as well. And that's what we're going to talk a little bit more about today. Here's our Franklin, and uh, he implemented the New Deal within the first 100 years of, of his office. Didn't really affect Long Beach still in those first few years because or the first few days of, of that, because, um, you know, we had oil, we had growth, we had, we were, we were represented in Congress as this very wealthy um, town in Southern California that was growing, that didn't need much help. In fact, when I looked at congressional records, um, I was hearing our Congress people argue for the fact that, you know, Long Beach needed some help. And they said, why? Your, your streets are paved with oil. Why would you need any help? We don't need to fund you. Well, fortunately, for, or unfortunately, as some people might say, we had an earthquake on March 10th. And that made it uh, very clear that Long Beach was going to need some help. We had a 6.25 or 6.5 earthquake on a Friday evening, March 10th, 1933. And here's a picture of uh, Franklin. It was Franklin Junior High at the time. Now it's called Franklin Middle School. Uh, and what happened to that school? It just completely crunched uh, in on itself. So the state authorities rushed in and they said, you know, we can't be having our schools, uh, you know, fall down. What if this had happened during a school day? We would have lost so many children. So one of the obvious, uh, some of the obvious decisions that they made was that schools were um, better off if they were uh, single story if possible, um, that they should not place chandeliers and canopies over entrances, and that this construction, um, uh, uh, the, the actual style of construction should be of better quality. So um, that instituted what was called the Field Act. And the Field Act made it so that uh, no, uh, no schools since that time have been demolished or um, greatly hurt by an earthquake uh, ever since the 1933 quake. So it really put into uh, the code uh, very tight constraints on what schools could build and how they could build. So what happened in Long Beach after the earthquake is we got a lot of money from the federal government and we built a ton of schools between 1933 and 1935. So I have a little printout here of the number of schools that were rebuilt after the earthquake with federal funds. You can see the year that they were built and, uh, and where they were located. And there's actually a second page on this. So let's drill down to a, a few schools. Um, this was Lowell Elementary School prior to the earthquake. This was its 1926 design. And in 1935, Edward Mayberry was hired to design the new James Russell Lowell Elementary School. Um, one note about all the architects I'm going to be mentioning. They were all local Long Beach architects. And that's also important to the, um, the New Deal, the, the WPA, um, and the plan that Roosevelt had was to put local people to work as much as possible. So now you see it's a single story. Uh, it has a little um, Art Deco look to it. Um, it's got medallions and uh, linear piers and a symmetry. It's very clean looking. So one of the things that, uh, Besides just building the school with local architects, we also uh, were able to request um, our, 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 mostly the principals had a big hand in this, uh, request that art also be included in the rebuild. And in this case, 
uh, Douglas Newcomb was the president of, uh, I'm sorry, the principal of uh, Lowell Elementary School. And he decided that he wanted to commission a piece of art for the school. So he went to the school board and asked that they, if they would uh, grant uh, permission to make an application to the uh, federal arts program to have a bust of James Russell Lowell. And uh, they said, yes. So here's a picture of James Russell Lowell and it was designed by Louis Zack, Z-A-C-K. Um, it says he was the architect, but he was not. He was the artist, the sculptor. Sorry about that. And this is a picture that is actually held at the Smithsonian, the art and artist files at the Smithsonian. Um, and it's made out of uh, Minnesotan carnelian marble, or granite, sorry. Minnesota Carnelian Marble. So now it's all polished up. This is what it looks like. It's in place in, the, in Lowell, uh, in the office, or outside the office. But who was Louis Zach? Here's a picture of him. Uh, out, he's uh, doing a, a lovely sculpture called uh, Florence Nightingale. Some of you, if you go up to Los Angeles, you might see that. It's in Lincoln Park in LA. Um, Louis Zach was born in Russia in 1901, and he just died in 1981. Um, he, he did work for the Federal Art Project while living in Los Angeles during the 1930s and 40s, and then he went on to work for the Red Cross. But um, he continued to do sculpture all of his life, and I, I, I love the fact that he is one of our local artists, and uh, we can still see a few pieces of his work. So we talked a little bit about the, the architecture of, of art deco or art modern. I'm not going to cover that much about the architecture. Hopefully some of you were able to participate in architecture week last month and caught uh, John Thomas's tour of art deco buildings in Long Beach and he's well versed in that topic. So uh, if you don't have his book, I would recommend you get it, Art Deco in Long Beach. Otherwise, um, I'm just going to briefly talk a little bit about um, why art deco became a big deal and um, in, in Long Beach as we started to transition and rebuild these schools. Clearly before when they were built, they were not built in the Art Deco style because the Art Deco style didn't come into being until kind of the late 20s. Uh, there was a, a, a movement in France that, that migrated from that very you know, brick and Beaux-Art look, a little more um, ornate, to a very clean and streamlined look. And there was two reasons for that. One, in the 19, late 1920s, early 30s, there was a great interest in speed. Um, flights were, were taking off, um, you know, the aeronautic industry, the trains, the ocean liners, and automobiles. And people loved, uh, you know, that type of feel that we're progress, lots of progress. And then the second reason is because we were experiencing a, um, a depression all over the world, um, the Art Deco schools were uh, less ornamentation, a little easier on the pocketbook. So let's take a couple of, we'll take a closer look at the Lindbergh Junior High School. It was built in, uh, this iteration was built in 1935. Um, and over the front door, there is a, uh, a map of Lindbergh's transatlantic flight that took place in 1927, of course, and that's who the school is named after. So the question is, the, um, the architect was Easton Harold. did he direct the design of this since it's on the exterior? Did he want to see some kind of bas relief or sculpture as a tribute to Lindbergh? We don't know that, we're still figuring that out. Uh, we do know that on the inside, the principal asked that the library have a wraparound mural. I think it's wraparound. It's three, three walls. Um, it's a massive five foot by 132 foot history of aviation, and the story takes takes place beginning with you know humans just dreaming about uh, flying to all the way through the end where uh, there's actually a, a beautiful uh, panel on um, what the future of flight would look like. And it, it's basically a, a picture of people just flying by themselves. Um, very fun. Uh, some of the artists that worked on this were Jean Goodwin, Arthur Ames, and Dor Bothwell. Well, Jean Goodwin and Arthur Ames were the actual designers, the drawers of what they called before a mural was put up of the cartoons. So a cartoon is like an outline of what 
Uh, the mural is going to look like all the figures, the placements, the scenes, things like that. And then often those designers would turn over the actual painting to other artists. And that's what happened in this case. So the drawings were turned over to her name was originally Doris Bothwell. She was an artist. Um, she was born in 1902 in San Francisco. She changed her name to Dor because she realized fairly early on as a young artist that being a female artist wouldn't get her uh, maybe the jobs that she wanted. There was preconceived notions about female artists. And so she uh, changed it to Dor. So it's kind of male or female, nobody really knew. Kind of what a lot of authors uh, also do when they, um, they assume a different name. So she married the, uh, she entered the art business. Um, she did marry in 1931, but they divorced four years later and she uh, moved to Los Angeles where she worked for uh, the pottery manufacturer, Gladding McBean, and uh, joined a post-surrealist group that centered around Lorzer Feidelson and Helen Lundberg. Now, if you're an artist, you know some of those names and uh, Dora Bothwell was a very good friend to both Feidelson and Lundberg. Um, so she worked on this mural, and I suspect that Helen Lundberg had something uh, to do with it as well, though she's not credited. And what Dora Bothwell said in an interview was um, when, when uh, Jean Goodwin and Arthur Ames gave her the cartoons, they were so small that she had to like basically take a, a magnifying glass to enlarge them and figure out what they really had wanted. So really this, this uh, mural, is a lot of Dora Bothwell because she had to interpret uh, Goodwin and Ames's design, and I think she did a very good job. You know, Bothwell went on to design dioramas for the Long Beach, uh, the LA County Museum, which used to be the LA Museum of Natural History as well. So she's very uh, dexterous art artist, if you will. All right, let's get to that next slide. Oh, here's a nice little inset, and there's Dora right there. She did a self-portrait in 1942. You can see she, she had a very, uh, uh, there's a surrealism to her as well. So that inset you see of the, uh, of the flight is Daedalus um, and Icarus dreaming of flight. <clears throat> Another uh, style, of, uh, this style of Arthur de Art Modern uh, was reflected in a couple of our junior high schools. They now call them middle schools. Jefferson, built in 1934, and then Washington Junior High. So well, let's look at Washington. Let's take a closer look at Washington. It was uh, designed by uh, W. Horace Austin. He was often called the Dean of Long Beach Architects, very high, high regard. And I think that might be why, since he was the architect on this, uh, on this building, why this uh, school got an amazing amount of art. Wait till you see. So uh, first of all, there's these medallions that that um, that face you when you when you enter the school. So there's uh, the, kind of that Federalist look with the eagle, and then there's the uh, the medallion of, of George Washington over the doorway. Um, these were pretty common uh, in Federalist art, like post offices and things like that. But we don't have a lot of that here. Uh, the only other building that had similar medallions like this with that nationalist or federalist style was the Veterans Memorial Building. As some of you of a certain age might remember that building, it was in our part of our Civic Center for a long time. Uh, it had a relief of, of federalist um, design by Merrill Gage, the very famous uh, sculptor, but that building was destroyed in 1978. So let's take another look at some of the other work at Washington. Doorways. These are doorway reveals. They're very deep and they have a, a bas, what's called a bas relief on them. Um, these uh, are allegorical representations of, of technical or social arts done in like a classical style. Um, so one question is, did Austin request that these you know, panels be, be done this way? Uh, or did he just say, I want art, do what you will? How much were the artists guided? Here's another door. You can see how beautiful these are. This is music and sculpture. But not to be outdone on the other, that was the cedar side of the cedar entrance of Washington. On the back side, if, if you will, of the Pacific Avenue entrance, 
Um, there are two uh, shops that have uh, two doors that go into shops, the metal shop and the wood shop. Here is this incredible kind of almost forgotten doorway uh, with this beautiful bas relief sculpture over the top. And then you can see the very um, fanciful Art Deco uh, uh, braiding over the, over the doors and actually the lighting as well. And here's the wood shop people making things out of wood. But let's go inside. And here we have the foyer. Um, it, uh, it's a black and white photo, but um, it does show uh, very clearly uh, the beautiful marquetry of uh, the ceiling, that beautiful, incredible um, uh, sconce, the chandelier, the, the hanging light, light fixture. It's really, on, on, it's just remarkable. And then um, <clears throat> you will see this, these uh, tiles on the staircase. Um, and those are actually a brilliant green. So you can see there's two staircases that lead uh, from the foyer, the lobby, up into the hallway where the offices are, etc. Uh, I understand that the offices also have uh, some of the same ceiling fixture or ceiling um, design as well. But again, Washington also had another mural and um, it's been lost. Um, it was either painted over or damaged and destroyed. Um, and I had a heck of a time trying to figure out what that was. I, I kept uh, reading that there was a, you know, a lost mural. It was supposedly by an artist by the name of Pasquale G. Napolitano. And uh, yeah, he was Irish, no, I'm only kidding. Um, and, uh, he, he, he painted a mural uh, depicting the sciences and um, nobody had really seen it. I actually sat with a graduate of Washington Junior High uh, from the 50s and she said, I, I don't remember seeing a mural. I don't know, but I was, you know, what it was, a like 13 or whatever, you know, she's, her mind was not on the science mural apparently. But it was, it was painted on the science building stairwell as you entered that building and um, and I ended up finding his archives uh, and uh, was able to procure this, basically this sketch of what that mural looked like. And there's a little inset of Pasquale right down there on the, the bottom. Um, he went on to become a leading artist for Merle Armitage. I don't know if you've heard that name, uh, but Merle Armitage did an awful lot of publications, books and, and things like that. And he used, uh, uh, you know, local artists to um, sketch out and, and do some of his uh, illustrations. So um, <clears throat> Napolitano traveled in, in good circles that way. Um, this photograph of him was by uh, Brett Weston. And that was his good friend and colleague as well, Edward Weston's son. I do think I've calculated out, I think this mural was uh, painted over in probably the in the early 1970s. Uh, Napolitano also uh, painted the uh, Hollywood Turf Club bar uh, backdrop, the, the mural for that as well. So Poly is another school that has a, um, a wealth of art and, and even just the architecture itself is, is a piece of art. Um, it was a re major, had a major rebuild in 1935. Of course, it is our oldest, our first high school in the city. Um, and I remember too that our high schools, um, even, even before the, uh, the New Deal, but certainly after the New Deal, art and um, inspiration was was printed or designed ingrained into the buildings to inspire and, um, and and just encourage students to be better people so over the entrance is a saying that says enter uh, go forth and serve go forth to serve um, and then in the courtyard there is a uh, saying that says we live in deeds not in years in thoughts not in breaths in feelings, not in figures on a dial. And that is from the poem Festus from 1839. So very high ideals our schools have. The clock was added later as a gift from uh, one of the graduating class. So that was just, you know, just lettering and, and, and pieces that are uh, part of the school architecture itself. 
But now we have doorways. So there are doors, it's a two-story building. There's uh, um, entrances all throughout um, several of the buildings and they are flanked by these cast concrete relief panels. Um, they have uh, figures and faces of various ins inspirational people. Um, who are these people? It's funny, about uh, 2011, there was a plea that went out uh, from Sean Ashley, who was the principal at the time. He's like, hi, I, who, who are all these people? We think we've identified him. He was kind of doing a scavenger hunt with the kids and invited the public to, to help him out. But if he had only called the Long Beach Public Library, he would have found that we had a clippings file here at the library that listed out all of the people on the panels one by one by one. Um, and uh, when, when the panels were erected, so we know that they are the actual uh, people. So I was able to trace who some of these were, and now you now know. So if you see the one on the left here, we have Oberholzer, who was, I think he was a writer, I'm so bad, Euclid, of course, the mathematician, and Michelangelo. But it was interesting, the um, panels didn't just reflect um, the greats of the past. David Bircham, was uh, the principal of Polly for a number of years uh, until 1941. And people called him Daddy Bircham. And um, he graduated you know, thousands of men and women from Polly over the years. And when he became principal in, oh, I don't know when he started, but there were 347 students and um, the, the enrollment grew to over 3,000, making it the largest high school in the state at that time. Uh, he retired after 34 years of service to the city in 1941. So it's nice that he was, um, he was, uh, um, let's say, commemorated here. Um, and then Jane Harnett is another person that uh, some of you might recognize. She uh, was a historian. She worked as the, she was the head of the history department in Long Beach uh, High School or Poly which is now Polly, and um, she developed the first student body commission in California. So she's commemorated on these panels as well. And I also love this picture because um, I didn't realize it, and now we all have to realize it, that some of the panels were used twice. So you see Euclid on the one on the left, you also see Euclid in the, uh, in the doorway on the one on the right. So they would, which is smart, you might as well use a few of them. There's about 70 panels. There's a few more there too. So we have Plato, Abraham Lincoln, Sir Isaac Newton. You can see there's panels up above and panels below as well. The panels aren't signed. Who, who made these? That's another one of my, my conundrums, the, the reason that I'm doing some of this research. I really would like to get to the bottom of some of this. So if anybody knows, let me know. Um, so I'm looking at what other sculptors did and looking at their work and seeing if some of it might be aligned. Um, Deje, De, J.L.J. was a sculptor who uh, worked around uh, this time period uh, for the WPA and he worked in Los Angeles. Uh, he worked in cast terraza and in wood. It's a similar style. Is it possible that he was the sculptor for the poly panels? Polly also has a mural, and this mural is important for a number of reasons. It's um, in the stairwell of Building 100. Um, and the graduates, uh, two graduates of, La of Poly High School actually uh, designed and painted this mural. It was Jean Swigget and Ivan Bartlett. Um, and it, the scenes are of uh, industrial activities in Long Beach. Again, trying as kids would pass by this on their way to classes, they're seeing all of the opportunities available in Long Beach. You could work in the port, you could work uh, in construction, you could, uh, you know, Apparently, go fishing with fish and all kinds of great things, but very fun. Um, and you could you, you could hopefully be inspired. Um, Swigget and Bartlett became artists in their own right, and they um, they're referenced in many catalogs and books for their art. And here's a few pieces: Don, uh, Jean Donald Swigget. This is some of the work that he ended up doing over the years. And then Ivan Bartlett. Sorry, Jean was a female. Sorry about that. 
And you can see, and I love the fact that Ivan Bartlett, uh, he, he ended up really specializing in um, tech, uh, textiles. So um, the cherries, raspberries, linen handkerchief was, um, is one of his pieces. And you can find um, other pieces of his work, very, very 50s, very 50s uh, kitschy stuff. So that's what happened. And then one more piece at Polly was uh, a, an easel, uh, framed easel piece by Eugene Brooks. He was also another Polly graduate and he uh, lived on Gundry and he studied uh, what Ivan and, uh, and Jean were doing and uh, tried to copy their style and he did a pretty good job of that. And this is supposedly still in the administration building hanging on the wall at Polly. I have to go over and take a look and make sure it's still there. Um, we're losing some of our architecture. Uh, the photo on the left shows the Theodore Roosevelt School in uh, 1935 by George Cars. It was demolished in 2013 and we now have uh, the new Roosevelt School um, in, in 2013. Other styles of architecture was not all streamlined modern and not all Art Deco. So we had Spanish, um, Here's a Lincoln uh, Elementary School designed by Kirtland Cutter. Uh, some of you know some of these other schools that also have that Spanish style. Okay, so other art though that we uh, covered is, is uh, some murals. And I don't know if anybody would remember this building being inside. This was the Carnegie Library down here at Lincoln Park in Long Beach. Um, and in 1937, Suzanne Miller was commissioned to, to uh, paint scenes from English literature. And it was installed uh, throughout the circulation uh, room. And uh, so she, she painted all these and there's, oh, I think there's like 15 different scenes of literature. And then when uh, the, the, I guess will we call it the, the middle library, the one that was just abolished uh, in Civic Center here, uh, had uh, had the, the they had to take down the old panels and um, then they put them in frames and then they posted them um, in the library that was here until just a few years ago. Then they were carefully removed again and cleaned and now they are posted in the Billie Jean King Main Library um, up on the wall and um, you can come and there's actually a uh, a sheet that you could look at that explains what each uh, panel is and what scene from literature it is. But they're all pieces of literature that, you know, I wish we read more, but we really don't. So, um, you know, Pilgrim's Progress, Canterbury Tales, The Lady of Shalott by Tennyson. Uh, what a difference, right? So anyway, so please come down to the, uh, the main library, Bailey Jean King Library, and, and take a look at some of these beautiful panels that are all clean and um, available for the public. Suzanne Miller, is, her name's going to come up again a couple more times, but I'm going to leave her for a moment. And we're going to go to uh, some of the other types of architecture. You can see the William Cullen Bryant School. It's up on, um, I want to say, Termino and, and 15th or so. Check out the little books that are just uh, set uh, uh, on either side of the doorway. Those are just little books because Bryant, of course, was a poet and a writer. And then the Grant School is very... Uh, almost very classic looking and McKinley School as well. And then there's the Jane Addams Elementary School. And we're gonna talk about that one a little bit. Edwald Baum was the architect. There's a lot of unattributed architectural detail at the Jane Addams School. And I also wanna mention that Jane Addams was, um, you know, we had a, a few women that we named our uh, schools after. I'm gonna have to I'm going to have to move along a little bit. Uh, but she was very important because uh, she had died in 1935. Um, and she was the first American woman to be awarded the Nobel Peace Prize. Um, she, some people may know her as this, uh, the Settlement House um, founder of Whole House. Um, and very, very progressive woman in terms of social um, services and things like that. So, you know, uh, we had a lot of women in Long Beach that were very... Um, strong and they had a voice and of course we were big voters here in the city and um and so in the 1930s and nu numerous new schools uh and sorry 1920s numerous new schools were um erected and named after uh, uh women of history and then of course when they were rebuilt after the earthquake they kept those names 
So here's another piece of architectural detail. This is a broken pediment above the auditorium door. Again, was this the, art, the architect's desire or was a special artist brought in? And I just love this too. That's the entering the library, but what is it? It's an open book, just sweet. But once you get into the library, you see another mural. This is a, a mural, again, by Suzanne Miller. Um, and it was painted in 1938. It's called A Visit to the Jungle. Um, and it's a fanciful illustration of three children visiting with an array of animals in a jungle setting. Suzanne Miller actually wrote a children's book to correlate to this mural. And it is supposed to be in the Adams Library. I would like to get a copy of that myself. Um, she did the cartooning, like I said, she did the design, but then they were trying to figure out how to best adhere this paint to this wall because it's a library. Shh, shh, you have to hush, right? So, and there's a lot of children. So you have to figure out how to do something so that you don't um, kill the acoustics. And her technicians really helped her with that. This is a close up of a, of a panel. Um, so who were her technicians? Because they did something to this that uh, they were able to uh, apply oil paints to the plaster without destroying the acoustical capability. And that is credited to her young assistants, Wilbur Broderick and Jesse Marsh. Um, Broderick went on uh, to um, be mostly a teacher, art teacher, but Jesse Marsh, was a very quiet man uh, and he stayed in the world of cartooning. He ended up working for Disney for quite a while and then for the Edgar Rice Burroughs um, uh, Corporation, if you will. And he has a reputation as one of his most prolific artists for the Tarzan comic books and they're quite collectible. Um, and he died in Monrovia, um, actually not that long ago. Yeah. So uh, I just love the fact that, you know, our, our artists who worked here in Long Beach went on to do these another, other amazing things uh, in the world and they got their start here for the most part. Uh, um, here's a Franklin Classical Middle School or at the time it was Franklin Junior High built in 1934. Again, a lot of bas relief details we're gonna see with this. George Riddle was a design builder um, and architect here in town. Uh, he also owned the Monarch Construction Company. So some of the, uh, the little details that are found in the outside of Franklin is the, um, the gymnasium. There's two entrances to the gymnasiums and uh, one is obviously it was supposed to be the entrance for the girls and what do girls focus on, but health and beauty. Mm -hmm. And the boys would focus on uh, sportsmanship, apparently. Um, it was interesting when I first started this um, research, oh gosh, 15 years ago, there was an actual delineation of boys, you know, girls under this one and the word boys uh, under this one. But uh, those were re these were chiseled out and removed sometime in the last 15 years. So who did this? I still don't know, but working on it. So this is the Santa Barbara Post Office. They have about 12 bas relief sculptures lining the interior of the post office in Santa Barbara. And this artist's name was uh, William O. Atkinson. So he was nearby in Santa Barbara. Uh, Franklin was built a year, year and a half earlier. It's conceivable that he, uh, <clears throat> he could have done work for us here in Long Beach uh, prior to his work with Santa Barbara. Um, so I'm in contact of, with a gentleman who has been collecting his work and work about him. Uh, and so we're trying to figure out if there's a way to find out if he worked here in Long Beach. One other piece in uh, Franklin is uh, the Sower and Reaper. It's really hard to see this. Uh, right now there's fencing up all over the school, so you really can't see it. This is over the auditorium, the backside of the auditorium. Um, really modern piece of work. Um, probably the most modern I've seen of the New Deal sculpture work. Um, and again, it's to refer to instructional in styles. You reap what you sow, you know, children. So, you know, take a lesson. 
inside uh, the foyer of Franklin, um, it was left blank. Um, it was always a plan to put a mural in there, but uh, either the school ran out of money or desire, or maybe there was a change in leadership, but it never got uh, painted. However, I found an article um, yeah, that, that mentioned that in 1945, the principal and the parents group decided that they wanted to raise the money to um, paint, get that mural painted that was supposed to be there. And so they did, and they hired Suzanne Miller yet again. And she did this kind of uh, very Japanese uh, feeling, um, uh, you know, these beautiful um, kind of washed out colors of a uh, mountain and lake scene. So I just love the fact that, uh, you know, clearly the colors that, sh that she wanted were already laid out in terms of that linoleum that's on the floor, right? So this uh, mural had been painted over probably in the 70s again. And um, uh, about in 2001, there was a, a call to try to uncover the mural because some of the teachers were kind of picking away at the paint and they found this mural underneath. And in 2015, the school district did um, manage to uh, have it uh, restored. So you can go in today and see a much nicer look. And for some reason, my screen has stalled. So let me see what I can do here. Let me see if I can get some technical help. I'm going to go on mute for just a second. All right, we are having technical guilt of difficulties, but we're almost to the point where um, I only had a couple more schools to cover. I'll keep looking. It's one of these things where my, I've got a spinner spinning, and uh, that means that my program has shut down for some reason. Um, so I was gonna talk a little bit about Rogers uh, Middle School, and then of course the recreation in Long Beach, that beautiful uh, mosaic mural that's downtown at the end of third and the promenade. So <clears throat> the reason I am doing this research is um, I feel like, you know, our society grows uh, every time we have big problems in this country, right? I mean, it, it, we just, we just come together, we figure solutions out and we see a leap in, in civilization and we see a leap in American culture. Um, so I'm, I feel like the, the, the New Deal era was one of those leaps and it certainly pertains to today as well. Um, you know, we had the Great Recession in 2008 and then um, we've got, you know, COVID-19, COVID-2020, possibly covid 2021, you know, how are we going to address this and um, what can we, what, what from the past can we use to help us inform today? So that's why I'm working on this and I, um, I think as Angela requested, if there's uh, stories that you have or if there's any questions that you have, I'd be happy to answer them. Um, we're going to start the, some, uh, some Q&A. Um, fairly soon. So we're going to open up uh, if you have something you want to share or some questions you want to ask, um, please do so. Um, yeah, I think you just put it in the chat. Is that right, Angela? Yes. Yeah, just uh, write it in the chat and we'll, we'll pull it up and I'll try to answer it. I'm sorry you missed the last two sections of uh, the, the last two
projects that uh, I was going to talk to. But I, there's also a lot of other things I didn't get a chance to discuss. Uh, obviously, the airport, if you haven't been up to the Long Beach Airport, that is the best free museum you will ever have. I encourage you to, uh, to go up there. And they have a wonderful um, uh, uh, brochure on the art that is there. And the airport has done a wonderful job of uncovering it and protecting it. So very happy to see, uh, see that as well. So that's my, my actual presentation and I'd be happy to answer any questions if you have any. Okay, so um, can everybody hear me? I hope you can. Um, we have a few questions that we're gonna start with. And if any members of our audience have other questions that you'd like to ask, again, you'll see the chat button at the bottom of your screen and you can type and submit them in the chat to us. And Maureen, if you want to exit um, your screen share and try going yeah. back in again, that might help you with your buffering issue there. Okay, um, okay so Maureen, the first question is, where did you find your research information for this program? Oh, that's a great question, thank you. Um, uh, you know, as, as a librarian, I just um, have, such as the reason I went into this field is because I absolutely love research and I appreciate the fact that there are people out there that hold archives that um, that have, uh, you know, kind of private um, projects that they've been working on and um, my, you know, being a librarian gives me access to so much of that. Um, you know, when I started this, oh, you know, years ago, of course, the first place I went was Google and, you know, you just keep saying the same stuff over and over again and some of it's not even right. So, you know, it, it, Google and searching online sometimes just perpetuates, you know, bad information. So um, really, uh, I, I tend to uh, talk to people. I uh, look at who's written on the subject and then I will contact them. Um, the Long Beach Public Library uh, History Collection is amazing and has a lot of obscure information for researchers, the Historical Society as well. And then of course, interviewing people who were here um, and then following up with them. But yes, uh, I really love digging around and it takes a while um, and it's an organizational nightmare sometimes uh, to keep it all straight, but I'm doing my best and, uh, and I'm, I'm, I'm really plugging away at it. So thanks for that question. Okay, so our next question is, are any of our local Long Beach artworks or buildings protected as landmarks? Uh, the, the airport has protection. Um, the, the big WPA uh, mosaic mural at Third and Promenade that used to be on the Municipal Auditorium uh, is a landmark. But for the most part, all the pieces that I showed today do not have any protection in terms of you know, formal protection. Okay, great. So we also have a question about, do you have any comments on the 1932 Olympics in Long Beach, like Marine Stadium, Rock Park Golf Course, and yeah. others? Yeah, so um, that's an area I didn't even touch on because I was working more um, with the, uh, uh, talking more about the artists. Um, but we had a number of buildings and facilities that the uh, New Deal or the WPA, the, the uh, PWPA actually um, funneled money into and you know one of the things I didn't explain is how did the money work um, so say for instance uh, let's see you talked about the Olympics the Marine Stadium Rec Park um, the let's say the the bowling the the lawn bowling green in Rec Park um, the city would apply to uh, the WPA program and say, we want to uh, build uh, the golf course or we want to build the, the, the lawn bowling course. Um, they, the city, the sponsoring agency would pay for the permits and the materials. And then the uh, WPA would pay for the labor. And so that's how most of our buildings were underwritten by the federal government. So yeah, that's, uh, so the, the, the uh, gentleman asked about the 1932 Olympics in Long Beach. We used them, we had that marine uh, stadium built, you know, they, they expanded uh, Colorado Lagoon and the arm from Alamitos Bay into that shape. 
and then um, uh, put in stands. Their stands are not there now, but there are other stands at the time, uh, so that there could be trials for the 1932 Olympics that took place in Los Angeles. And it was a really great boon for Long Beach, brought people here, um, and they could see our beautiful, um, our beautiful city. Okay, wonderful. We have another question about Washington Junior High. Is it still intact in the Federalist style? So Washington is, uh, it is an art modern style, but the uh, Federalist aspect were those medallions. Yes, it has the eagle and then Washington's medallion over the entrance. Everything you that I showed you at Washington is still there, except for that science building mural, which hasn't been seen since about 1971. Okay, we have another question. Um, so interesting that so many of the WPA murals are at LBUSD schools. Where else can they be found, if any place? Mm. So the, uh, the Long Beach, uh, Airport for sure. Um, of course, here at the library, at the Long Beach Public Library, the main library, the Billie Jean King Library has the, those murals, but they've been transported. Um, the mosaic mural that uh, used to be on the Municipal Auditorium and is now uh, at Third and the Promenade. Um, those are the major ones that are not in schools that I can think of offhand. Um, but our schools got the majority. Again, uh, it was uh, because we had the earthquake and we lost so many of those schools. So they were great canvases uh, for the artists to come down and, and utilize. Um, what about the Port Administration building, the artwork that was on the outside of that, the old one before? Yeah, that, that mural was done in the 50s, I believe. So it was not part of the WPA project. And that was taken down. It's been carefully uh, saved. And it is awaiting a spot to be relocated. So if the uh, person who asked that question has a nice long area that they could put a mural in, let Long Beach Heritage know. Because uh, Long Beach Heritage is the group that um, worked very hard to save that port mural. Okay, and we have another question. Are school yearbooks a good source of old photos and artist information? They can be, that's a really good question. Um, I have, um, so when I started this project back in 19, uh, 2001 to 2004, um, we, uh, we conscripted a bunch of volunteers. Uh, and if you're one of the people listening to this, thank you for that. Um, and we contacted each of the schools and we said, we're gonna have a volunteer come out. We're just gonna look for art that we were told was either there or we believe is there, or there might be some art that hasn't even been discovered yet. And one of the things our volunteers are gonna to want to do is look through the old yearbooks. And, um, and that is because they would often have in the background um, pieces of the art. I do know when the uh, uh, Franklin uh, mural was um, getting restored and they were trying to figure out what it actually looked like. They, uh, the, the restoration uh, study group did look through old murals and they um, transcribed or took photographs of the photographs from the yearbooks that showed students standing in front of the like I think it was the lost and found which was in the foyer and where you could clearly see the mural and what that also helped them to do was date when the mural disappeared because pretty soon those same students or students later still standing in front of the lost and found and there's no mural behind them so um, that's how that's how it's really not um, an exact science you have to do a lot of extrapolation Okay, so um, if anyone has WPA stories, you know, family members that were involved in that process, um, please leave a note in the chat with your email contact information and Maureen can follow up with you more later. And then I also want to mention that if people have more questions or interest in WPA art, architecture and artists in Long Beach history, there's, as Maureen has mentioned, there's a lot of information in our library collection and special collections that the public has access to, whether through checking out materials or submitting research requests to us here in the Miller Special collections room at Billie Jean King Bean. So you can send research requests through the Ask a Librarian link on the Special Collections and Archives webpage on our website. And we're just at about four o'clock right now. 
Um, so if anyone needs to leave right away, we want to thank you again for joining us. And for anyone who has additional questions that you'd like to ask Maureen in the chat after the program, you can do so for another 10 to 15 minutes until 4.15, and then we'll have to end the meeting. And uh, if you have a question but you don't have time to stay, please feel free to submit your question with your email address and we can get them to Maureen so she can reply to you maybe at a later time. Um, so at that, uh, you know, I'd like to thank uh, all of you guys for uh, joining us again today and thank Maureen for today's wonderful local history lecture series program on the WPA Art, Artists and Architecture of Long Beach, and for her gracious support of our educational enrichment of the Long Beach Public Library community. And I'd also like to thank our library administration and staff, the Friends of the Library, the LBPL Foundation, and many other of our local contacts for helping to promote our event, and Maureen as well, because I know you helped get the word out. Um, our sincerest thanks and appreciation to all of you. Have a wonderful afternoon, everyone. We'll see you again at the library soon, hopefully. Um, sometime after the beginning of the year. But in the meantime, we have LBPL to go and you can check out materials. So please make sure to check our website if that's new to you and you haven't heard about it. Um, it's a wonderful opportunity for you to keep checking out materials with us. But in the meantime, if anybody has any extra questions, please stick around. Feel free to uh, mention it in the chat and we will stick around for a few more minutes to help you. So thanks again, everybody. Thank you. Take care, stay safe and uh, have a wonderful afternoon. We'll see you again soon. Thank you. Okay, Maureen, so. Um, if anybody has any questions, you could just unmute. Can they unmute themselves? You could just talk as well. Okay, sure. Um, we can try to unmute everybody. Um, we'll get, Jade is gonna work on that for us, but in oh. the meantime, we will ask uh, questions in the chat until she gets that going. Um, there was a question from Kay Briegel. She wondered where you got that <laughs> photo of Grant Elementary School. She knows darn well where I got that. It's from her. <laughs> and she's in that picture too. <laughs> you have many, many people thanking you for all of your help with the program and all of your research. Oh yeah, no, it's not something you can do in a vacuum. Um, and I, I am uh, always super appreciative of, uh, you know, people sharing stuff with me and I, and, uh, I try to you know, represent that as best I can. Okay. All right. Well, thank you. You still have many thanks rolling in. Um, and uh, someone asks, is it possible to tape the rest of your presentation slides to be included with the recorded tape? Um, what we can try to do, um, we'll work that out and see what we can do. If Maureen can make some of that information available to yeah. us. We'll work that out and see what we yeah. can do. Yeah. Or, you know, I'm wondering if, if there, you know, I didn't even get to the airport. I didn't get to a couple other, you know, like uh, the Bowling Green and the, the, two, the, the lot of the areas that um, are not quite art specific. We might be able to do a, a part two you know, maybe next year sometime. And you're welcome, Maureen, again, if you want to try reopening that presentation. Maybe oh, it'll work for you now. If you have just a minute, you know, we have a few yeah. minutes. Um, let's yeah. see if we have any other questions. No, nope, it's not going to work. Okay, so you do have a question about, um, do you remember the home SNL on Lakewood Boulevard in Carson Street, and do you know what happened to it? It was the home SNL on Lakewood Boulevard in Carson. Standard and loan, that must be standard. Yeah, yeah. home savings. Home savings. Oh, savings. So, um, it, that is the uh, the bank that I believe Farmers and Merchants has um, has taken over. So there was a mural on the interior and a mural on the fountain um, outside. And I believe the uh, museum at Cal State Long Beach um, has made uh, an effort to remove at least the exterior mural, the mosaic mural, and um, reinstall it on the campus or near or in the museum. And I'm not sure if they're gonna be able to do the same with the interior uh, painted mural. Um, I don't believe there's any plans to do anything with the fountain. It's a sculpt, uh, bronze sculpture. 
Um, but if anybody knows for sure, feel free to pipe in. Um, but that is what I understand. And kudos to the museum for uh, taking that on and recognizing that it's a Miller Sheets um, designed mural and very different from uh, Miller Sheets's normal style. So I'm really happy to see that mosaic uh, be, get a second life. Um, and it will take funding. So if anybody wants to donate to that, please contact the museum at Cal State Long Beach. Um, absolutely. Okay, here, if you wanted to cruise through a few things here, I can do that for you. Oh, okay, yeah. No, I think we're good. Okay. Yeah. All right. Yeah, we'll, we can do this another, I mean, if we, okay. if we do a part two, I'll cover the rest of uh, Lowell and then uh, the mosaic. Okay. Any other questions while we're here? Okay, I think, that looks like it's about it. Um, that's it. Okay, okay. guys. Well, thank you so much again for joining us. If you can get a hold of me and or even through the library, if you've got anybody in your family that worked for the WPA, I'm collecting uh, stories. Um, you know, Historical Society has some, but we can always use more. And of course, photographs and things like that too. Um, so uh, keep that in mind that this is ongoing research and really appreciate you dialing in and any uh, anything you can send to me in the future would be much appreciated. Thanks. Okay, thanks again, everybody. Thanks again, take care.